This is a um, makeshift emergency podcast. <laughs> you have this winning warm-up system that I mm -hmm. think is just great. Can you explain that a little bit? When I met you, you were huge. Somebody comes to me and says, I'm going to squat 1,000 pounds in six months. They can get the fuck away from me. Somebody that's carrying a lot of body fat can be insulin insensitive. And when they eat too many carbs, they're just going to store body fat because that's what they've been programmed to do hormonally. Like about a year ago, I think you broke Tom Platz's record. What yeah. was that, five? five? I did 520 for 24. If it takes me 10 more years to get where I'm at, fine. Yeah. I'm here anyway. He'll take up the challenge, and he will probably beat the shit out of anybody. Kill you. My goal is to try to get better as I get older. You had to take what Louie wrote. Mark had to take what Louie wrote. Chuck had to take what Louie wrote. So I'm fucking reading everything I can because I'm not bringing half-ass shit to Chuck. Morning out of Sacramento, California. Woo! What you gonna do? Better. Stronger. Son of a bitch. Faster. Oh, yeah. All right, this is a um, makeshift emergency podcast. <laughs> the emergency is you just showed up here on your motorcycle. Yeah, from Ohio. And you're like, let's podcast or something. Yeah. And you always have such great information <laughs> that I figured be, uh, it'd be great to talk to you and yeah. get some you know, more yeah. information. One of the things actually we were, we were talking about, uh, I don't know how much we went over it last time, but I'd like to go over it this time because I think it's really important. You have this winning warm-up system that I mm -hmm. think is just great. Can you explain that a little bit and how sure. people could apply that to sort of any sort of workout, whether it's bodybuilding, sure. powerlifting? I'll try to keep it simple, but usually your limiting factors are soft tissue like cartilage, ligaments, tendons, things of that nature, right? You hear somebody get hurt. Usually it's one of those areas mm -hmm. that causes the issue. So um, – 2013, I switch over to completely raw from equipped. And um, when I do so, I go to my first raw competition. The world record in the squat was 826. So I hit right under 800 at that meet. First meet ever raw. But I get to the bench press, and I had already done a 600-pound raw bench. And that bench was nowhere to be seen. I had done really good things in the gym, but that squat had really kicked my butt. So as I'm driving home, I have my first initial thought process that, you know, as a power lifter, I need to get stronger. And then this thing clicked in my head. I had just read this uh, Soviet training manual, and they were talking about the work capacity base in order to g gain strength. Your fitness level needs to be high enough in order to restore from workouts. And I'm thinking, shit, as I've gotten stronger, I've actually gotten less fit because I was trying to gain my weight. And you come from West Side Barbell, so you guys were already doing a lot of that kind of stuff, like dragging sleds and things? We, we were doing GPP stuff, but we weren't doing it pre-lift. So what we would do is have off days, which makes sense at the time. But what I started to realize is that if I didn't get used to the fatigue after a squat, that my bench press would suffer 10 15%. What is a GPP, just for people? General Physical Preparedness. Basically just means fitness. So it's a fancy term that the Soviets and the Eastern Bloc countries use for general fitness. You know, you wouldn't want specific general fitness in weightlifting to be just, say, running. But you would want it to be stuff that mimics a little bit more like weightlifting, like dragging sleds, walking in water, you know, three, four feet tall. Things like that would be general fitness for a weightlifter. So I start reading some books by Isserin, which was one of the top researchers from the Soviet Union, and he talks about this minimal effective dosage was around 40% of your best. So I already had the limiting amount of weight that I knew I needed to use. And since I didn't use a percentage base unless I was competing, I switched that to a 4 RPE, which in my opinion is this should be the same as 40%. RPE means rate of perceived exertion. As you get better at lifting, you may have to switch to a rate of perceived exertion because, as you and I well know, training stressors change as you get older and as you get stronger, whereas percentages can become very hard to follow once you become world-class because your ability to recover becomes diminished because you can actually strain. Sure. Right? So I um, also know, noticed that I needed a little bit more muscle mass and a little bit less fat mass, so I need to be in better shape which is what most people would consider fitness anyway. Sure. So I get a hold of the world-famous bodybuilder, Flex Wheeler, and I'm like, hey, Flex, mm -hmm. what was the number on the reps that you felt put on the most muscle mass? And he goes, oh, at, without a doubt, doing sets of 20 made me jacked. And our buddy Stan Efferding, who trains with Flex a lot, mm -hmm. says the same thing all the time, right? Sets Absolutely. Of 20 old... So now I knew 20, 25 was the rep range, and I knew 4RP was around the range I needed to be at, and it was also a range in which I never trained as a powerlifter. So I'm thinking, well, not only is this law of accommodation, 
which states that doing the same thing over and over again has diminished results. This was a hell of a shock to the system. This was nothing like what I had ever seen at Westside Barbell. Yeah, once you get over 10 reps, you're dying when you're a power lifter. <laughs> Absolutely. So I implement this with bench only, and in about eight months, my bench went from missing 585 to smoking 606 after squatting the all-time world record. So now I start implementing it with the squat. Now I implement it with the squat, and my squat goes from, I take the world record from 826 to 832, and then nine months later it goes 832 to 870 in a belt. And, and we, I was already at the top. We just talked about the syndrome that people have coming to the gym and maxing out like every other week, every yeah. three weeks. You're going the opposite. You're going oh. like, let me do a bunch of light stuff to build the mm -hmm. strength in these muscles, the durability in these tendons and ligaments yep. to be able to push those Yeah, weights. and like I talk about all the time, it's not what you can do. It's what you can recover from. And the sets and rep ranges in which you ignore eventually become your limiting factor. So when I started to plug this in, it, it was, one, something my body had never seen. Two, the volume was so much higher, but three, my ligaments, tendons, and my technique even got better from that point. The winning warm-up, what it does is it primes the main, one exercise is the main primer. So if it's a squat that I'm going to do that day, it's a squatting type warm-up. The other two exercises. What, what would it be? Maybe a so belt squat? A belt or squat a... or a goblet squat or a kettlebell swing. Um, in a squat, more of a squat style position to loosen up the hips and get the squat position ready. Fairly light weights, or like yeah. so that you get to 25, you're straining. Yeah. So or when you're... I say four RPE, um, 25 reps, it should feel like a slight burn, with good and, and actually perfect like technique. You could, still, you could still keep going. Yeah, you could do 30 or 40 if you had to. Sure, but you okay. stop at 25. Yeah. So that's one exercise of four sets of 25. The other two exercises are what we guess or know are primary weak points. So one would be, for say the squat for example, would be a hamstring glute activation or a lower back or bracing type exercise. Most people are gonna miss a squat because of their lower back, their core or their hamstrings not functioning correctly. I know that sounds crazy because everybody thinks quad, 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 but in reality that quadricep to hamstring ratio balance is crucial for the central nervous system to fire the quad as hard as it possibly can. If it senses an imbalance, the body's only gonna turn on as much as it feels it can control, right? So you might have very strong quads and squat say 500 pounds, but if your hamstrings are gonna hold you back, working on more quads is not gonna help. So what I did was I guesstimated where I thought my weaknesses were, plugged them in, had that warm up, what we call potentiation, which means you're actually kind of learning the answers before the test. So I call compound movements like bench press, squat, deadlift, basically a test. When you do the warm up first, you're getting the answers to the test before the test arrives. And so you have to be fit enough to use it yeah. and you have to pick the right exercises and the right intensities. But after you do that, it's basically cheating the test. What's a weak point for you? You seem pretty damn strong. No, nah, I don't have many anymore, but when I first started, um, my legs were always really strong. So I had to catch up my glutes and hamstrings. Once those caught up, the squats went to the moon. Um, and then like almost everyone else, it's not really what your legs can do. It's what your back and your core can hold. So we learned that very, very quickly in equipped lifting because no matter what suit or what belt you got on, when you got 1,200 pounds on your back, you're not going to have a weak spot or you're in big trouble. Yeah, you're uh, very interesting to me. Like when I met you, you were huge. I don't know how much, if you weighed more or you, you were yeah, just like, more. or you're just heavier. Um, but you're in great shape for a power lifter. You have your legs are shredded. You know, you're you weigh 250 now. Last time I saw yeah. you were like 270. Something? Yeah, 265. Something like that. So yeah. you're always in good shape. You have no belly really. Like it's yeah. kind of crazy how good of shape you're in yeah. uh, for a power lifter. How how did you get there? Have you? I mean, I know I knew you when you were younger. And I I just um, picture you as just being way bigger mm -hmm. and bulkier. But you've always had kind of a good physique. Yeah. Well, I think a lot of that's from starting off in lifting from guys that didn't know how to get stronger other than how to get better at reps. So I remember being able to do 45 reps, for example, with 225 before I could bench 500. That's just how we got stronger yeah. at the local YMCA because none of us knew any better. Then as I met Louie and started understanding force and intent and speed work, um, I already had that base muscle set. And so when I implemented a conjugate system, I already had a lot of base muscle. Then fast forward 10 years later, I'm getting in very tight with Dr. Serrano, 
which yeah. is world famous. And he's like, Matt, look, you know, you're a big guy. You're pretty healthy for how big you are, but you're not going to be able to sustain this. Your blood work is starting to go south. This was about 34, so about 10 years ago. I go, what do I need to do to stay stronger and maintain this longer? He goes, you got to clean up your fucking diet. And I said, okay, well, how do I do that? He goes, your carbs are all over the place. The first thing I want you to do is switch all your carbs to rice. And I'm like, well, what the fuck? I mean, if it's rice or pizza, what's it? I don't know. Yeah. What's the difference? And I have a master's degree in biomechanics, but my undergraduate was a lot of nutrition classes. And it's just stuff that's not taught. And he goes, well, rice is non-inflammatory. And I'm like, inflammation. I'm like, hmm. So I start looking at my diet and I start realizing, one, I'm allergic to dairy. So when I would gain weight, I would drink a ton of chocolate milk because it made me gain weight. I was gaining inflammation. How did you know you were allergic to dairy? You would just have breakouts or problems? Um, I would automatically get beet red. My stomach would get pissed. Um, my blood pressure would go up. Um, a lot, a lot of other factors in my bloodstream. It's really hard to cut out dairy. Like to me, dairy is like my lifeline. Yeah. But I think I have problems with it too because I have some issues on my skin that won't go away and mm -hmm. some other issues. And when I cut out dairy, it seems to go away. Yeah. So that might be a thing that you just put in my head. Like maybe I should yeah. cut that for a minute. It's just or really least, hard. Or at least cut it back. I mean, you know, I know a lot of people that have, I was starting to get genetically triglyceride issues yeah. from milk. When I cut milk out, my triglycerides got cut 200 points yeah immediately see i love i love listening to like people like lane norton who will give you like the straight shot on everything but i also think that these people don't have all the answers like i think that um lane will say well mm -hmm. you know wheat isn't on its own inflammatory like there's no study about and i'm like i get it like there's no study but people get fucked yeah. up from wheat it's very right? difficult people get fucked up from things it's very difficult with training studies and nutrition studies i believe especially in america because everybody's so individual. What you eat may not affect me and what I eat may not affect you. So when you do a study, you need 10 or 12 participants, right? Minimum. Yeah. Well, not all of those 10 or 12 people are exactly the same. So in my opinion, it's the same with training is that you have to be careful just utilizing 100% black and white when there is a bunch of gray. Yeah. Right. And so, um, so for me, when I cut the dairy out, I not only lost about 25 pounds within about two months my blood work got about 30 percent better in eight weeks and i was like holy a, a lot shit of, a lot of people and maybe mark and i are part of this uh, a lot of people are afraid of carbs like i don't think mark and i are afraid of carbs at all H uh, however because we've made up stuff like hey mm -hmm. do a three-month war on carbs that's really to get people to like drop a bunch of weight it's not like for people to yeah. do forever and yeah and so i think people need to realize like everything's kind of a kind of a tool yeah but i heard you talking to russell before about his diet yeah. and what's interesting is like every time we don't know where to go we just go ah, let's go back to carnivore right pretty much what we yeah. do right well i think the other thing that you're hitting on too is that war on carbs which i in agreement with may start to show people their problems with dairy or gluten or something else that might yeah, be when you remove an, those things an yeah. individual issue when you start pulling let's say you pull five things away and something magical happens like you drop 20 pounds and you feel way better in your blood work books which one of those five things you cut out was the problem yeah that's why we do these map testing to see what we have inflammatory markers from certain vegetables like maybe you function really well on broccoli but maybe it gives him dietary distress and maybe it makes me completely bloated and i feel like shit yeah it's still a healthy food for most people but for some people it just has a bad reaction for me that was processed dairy so when i cut that out uh serrano was like we're on it yeah and so when i flipped my carbs to mostly rice i just started turning into a road map even though i was eating very similar amount of grams of carbs i had no inflammation you know it's weird because i really love rice i love potatoes I tend to eat like this low carb diet when I have full access to Piedmontese beef, mm -hmm. which is leaner. So I could e even eat that with rice and potatoes pretty much every day. Yeah. And I've been thinking about switching more over to that and kind of yeah. staying in that. But if I wanted to have carbohydrates, Russell wants to have carbohydrates. What's a good, like how much do you need? Because I think we always, I think the excess is what kills us, right? Yeah, excess of anything is bad. I think, I think the thing of it is, is like if you look at, Normal Eastern Chinese people that have never been introduced to Western diets, they're eating rice almost on a consistent basis, and none of them are fat. Yeah. So there's 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 green flag one 
right? If they're eating rice every freaking meal and they're not getting fatter. And what are they eating? Like rice and fish. Rice and fish, lean, rice right? and lean meats, yeah. right? So I think that's one of the big things. Plus, they don't eat anything processed hardly. Now, not to say that everything that they do is correct, but you get my point. I think that what you should start with is it depends on how much you weigh. You know, if somebody's 400 pounds, for example, you're going to have to give them a little bit more fats and carbohydrates to slowly change their lifestyle. Anything that you do drastic can be a bad scenario. Yeah. So what I find is like somebody comes to you. Let's let's put it back in my ballpark, for example. Somebody comes to me and says, I'm going to squat a thousand pounds in six months. They can get the fuck away from me because one, they have no idea what that takes. And two, it's a long-term process to get that yeah. strong. And and Russell and I are going to require a lot different carbohydrate load. Like, well, I was just using in general, like a bodybuilding diet usually has like 60 or 70 grams of fat. Yeah. And I was like, oh, you need to eat 60 yeah. or 70 grams of fat. And like, no, he would need a lot more than that. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, yeah, he weighs twice as much as I do. And like, that's his satiety, he's used to feeling full on poor fat choice selections in food. So if you don't keep his fats high... What's he going to go to? Poor carbohydrate selections, and his appetite's going to get out of control. So, again, it comes back down to individual processes for each person and where they're at in that particular part of life. Charles Poliquin had this interesting theory. Don't know if it's right or wrong, but it does make sense to me. Think of carbohydrates as a snowball on the top of a mountain. Going down the wrong side of the mountain, you eat carbs, you get fatter. Mm -hmm. But if you're insulin sensitive and you eat carbs, what does it do? Puts on muscle. So if you get a guy that's super lean and you give him the right amount of carbohydrates, he's going to train harder. He's going to put on more muscle with it because he's insulin sensitive. Somebody that's carrying a lot of body fat can be insulin insensitive. And when they eat too many carbs, they're just going to store body fat because that's what they've been programmed to do hormonally. So it's dependent on the individual and where they're at at that time. So could you say your nutrition is almost as simple as like meat and rice? Meat and rice. If you, if you want to start somewhere and make sure you're getting everything, you cook rice and you put a little bit of grass-fed butter in it and a little bit of morton iodine salt right for taste and for your fat soluble yeah. vitamins and your iodine for your thyroid and then you select usually depending on if you're overweight or underweight or where you're at in your cycle would depend on the fat amount of your meat and then i just um uh, season it with different types of seasoning like taco yeah ranch try to find stuff that's I'll healthy switch it up every once carne in a while. asada and, I, dude, I've been eating yeah. that for, like, five years, and you've seen the transformation in five years. Yeah, absolutely. And you've also seen, if I want to, my strength is exactly where I left off when I competed. This, this is a good time for a plug. Have you tried Mark's new steak shakers? I'll give you some. Uh, he, he makes these um, spices now that are, like, taco seasoning, Montreal steak seasoning. I'm on it. Italian seasoning, and they all have organs in it. And it doesn't oh. taste like organs. So it's just a nice, like, little Booster. way to <clears throat> supplement. Like, if you yeah. had it every day on your meat and used a different one yeah. just for flavor, yeah. you're probably – you're adding about 100 milligrams of organ powders of a Perfect. specific organ. So if you took it over the course of a week, mm -hmm. it's probably enough organs without eating liver. But, and yeah. also, like, Mark makes the steak shake and supplement it with that. You're, you're pretty good. So that's kind of the reason why he came out with all those. Yeah. He knows it's not like – a one-stop shop like don't ever sure. eat liver again but most people will never eat liver so this yeah. ways people can get some in their diet which would be great for me because i don't eat that shit either yeah well, so I, I would like to try that out but yeah i think the thing of it is is don't do anything drastic if you're trying to diet do it slow um you know when stan first helped me with in conjunction with serrano he's like i want you to eat a cheat meal every three days so i did but after about 60 days that 12th or 15th meal that cheat meal destroyed my stomach yeah and then I moved it to five days. And then every five days, it would destroy my stomach. After a while, it's kind of like, you know, when you take medicine, like alcoholics would take to puke because they're drinking. Mm -hmm. It's almost like, yeah, that sounds good, but I'm going to be on the toilet in 20 minutes. So why fucking eat it? Yeah. And so after a while, you just don't care anymore. And then that's when the magic starts to happen because then you look at food for what it should be, which is a fuel, not something that you that you mentally go really, to as a crutch. It really is fascinating when you eat like rice and, and red meat, like good quality red meat and rice, you feel like you're fueling your body. Yeah. It doesn't feel like food. Yeah, it if feels you feel, different. If you feel bloated and you feel like you want to take a nap and you feel lethargic after you eat, you're eating either the wrong things or your portion sizes are way out of fucking whack. Yeah. But I will tell you this, I can eat as much rice and beef as I want 
and within 20 minutes I can walk in the gym and train like a fucking animal. And you do that with pizza, good luck. Yeah, yeah, you'll just right. Be, you'll be so dying. it's automatically telling you your stomach will let you know after a while. I think Stan like sort of hit this on the head like a long time ago. The first thing I ever heard Stan ever really say about the di- about a diet was, you know, follow the diet that you can follow. That's the first mm-hmm. thing he said. Like the diet that works for you is one that you'll follow. Mm-hmm. And then the other thing he says is like, don't hurt your stomach. Mm-hmm. Like literally, like if that's your only rule from Stan, don't don't yeah. let anything hurt your stomach. You're like, oh, okay. And then you start finding the foods that, that don't yeah. hurt. And you realize you're cutting out so many bad things. It starts avoiding things. That end up killing your stomach. You know? Absolutely. And you find most of that stuff's processed shit that you know is not good for you anyway. It's never a piece of fruit. It's never no. a piece of meat. And it's never So rice. what I can tell to anybody is what worked for me and would probably work for a lot of people is do a cheat meal every three days until your stomach gets pissed. You know, and it, Because at first it won't because you're used to eating that way. But you think about it, that's only one bad meal every 12 to 15 meals, depending on how many times you're eating a day, then that's not very many. Yeah. That's only what? You're eating 95% I also clean? Think from what I've, what I've experienced personally, if you stick to foods that come from the earth, you have no problems. It's when we start adding all these mm-hmm. things together is when we see problems. When yeah. we see, and so it's not like that processed foods are so bad, but some of them are. A lot of them are. A lot of them have mm-hmm. vegetable oil, sugar, and we we tend to like blame things on um, vegetable oil. That's like a big thing now. Mm-hmm. And you're like, it's just a crappy product in general. Just mm-hmm. get it out of your diet. You probably don't need it. Yeah, I it, noticed with vegetable oils and cheap cooking oils that my stomach can't handle it anymore. That's what I'm saying. It's the stomach problem that that. So again, if your stomach's telling you and you're going to eat this and you're shitting your guts out for better terms in 25 minutes, it's automatically telling you whatever was in that meal. Your body does not want and doesn't like. All you have to do is be ready to listen. What's because fascinating is we have zero good um, salad dressings on the market. Zero. Yeah. Like so, they make these Primal Kitchen ones made with avocado oil that I think taste a little funny. They don't taste that great. Mm-hmm. They don't really make much with olive oil. Right. Like, like olive oil, you gotta buy. Yeah, you gotta buy it separate and do it yourself, mm-hmm. and like it becomes like a hassle. And I, yeah. I actually think the best salad dressings is like olive oil and, and yeah. like vinegar or balsamic yeah. vinegar. Yeah, balsamic vinaigrette. I even if, like just balsamic vinegar by itself without oil. My sure. Mark and I have this theory that people don't really need any oil. Like oils, uh, um, it's almost like sugar. Yeah. You've concentrated down, instead of all the carbohydrate, you've concentrated all the fat into this juice mm-hmm. that you could drink and get 5,000 calories in a cup of it. You know, mm-hmm. And so like, I don't think that that's the way the body was meant to process no. and take in things. Now, no. if you ate a whole olive, your body would process that differently. Well, it has all these other factors in the olive that's with the oil. It's just like fiber. If all you're that. eating a piece of fruit is much different than eating or drinking fruit juice that's yeah. been processed because they've taken all the sweetness out of it but really left very marginal amounts of those quality things that actually the fruit has. This slows the insulin response. Helps the body digest and clean. And then when you're smart like Stan, you can figure out how to actually use that as a weapon. You can weaponize yeah. the quick carbs, right? So, like, mm-hmm. he'll say, hey, have, like, a little four-ounce shot of orange juice, like, mm-hmm. at a certain time of day to do this to your hormones yep. or whatever. So you're, like, actually can weaponize some of these things. Which too. is amazing if you can control that because when I first learned, Oh, I couldn't control it. Yeah, when I first learned that, I was like, oh, I can just drink orange juice. Well, then I'm... Blah, 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 blah. I told Stan, I'm like, dude, I'm you drinking know, a gallon of orange juice. Who the juice. fuck drinks four ounces of orange That's juice and weighs Stan. 300 pounds? I told Stan, the problem with your you know? diet is I can't drink four ounces of orange juice. He goes, that's not my fault. <laughs> yeah. So the thing of it is, it comes back down to portion sizes as well. I, I had to cut orange juice completely out of my system for about a year to get control over it, where almost now, when I have something like that, it's too sweet. Like you start changing your taste buds to where you want more bland type foods because it's too much of a shock to the system. You know what I think most people would need? It would help people so much if somebody just hung out with Stan or Mark or you for like a day. Yeah. Like you, I tell people this all the time, you learn so much from all you guys. Like everybody's got all these little tips and secrets and tricks. And they're all kind of the same, kind of similar, right? Mm-hmm. Like they're all basically saying a lot yeah. of the same things. And I yeah. think people just would need to like to see what people do. Yeah. Like if you saw what Stan did every day, he yeah. is so meticulous. Like he's got everything yeah. packed up, ready to go, blah, blah. Yeah. And you're like, there is no way this guy could ever fail. Yeah. And, there, and the thing of it is you have to look at both all three of our scenarios and what appeals to you. I think Mark's on the leaner side. Stan's still trying to hold on to as much strength as he can as an older age. 
and I'm still trying to stay in powerlifting type shape, yeah. which is going to allot me a little bit more flexibility, where Mark's going to have to be a little bit more stringent, and Stan's going to have to be more stringent because of age. So they're very similar, but the goals and the where you're at in your life as far as what's important to you is going to be is really the small differences, yeah. honestly. You know, recently you broke, like about a year ago, I think you broke Tom Platz's record. What yeah. was that, five? five? I did 520 for 24. 520 for 24. Yeah. Got a lot of criticism, right? We talked about that last time. Yeah. <laughs> um, By people that couldn't do it for one. But, but yeah. hey, but hey, <laughs> you did it. And um, and you also recently, a couple months ago, maybe a month ago, squatted like 750, yeah. right? 750 on the second rep. So I did um, 700, stood there, let him load 750, and did it. Oh, wow. Again. So that's I, it was thing. supposed to be a heavy double that day, and I just felt good. And when you get older, you just take when you got it. Yeah. So instead of waiting until the next week to so do So they seven, loaded the weight while it was on your back, so uh -huh. on, on your shoulders? Yeah, yeah. That's wild. Which I, if you watch my training, I do that. Well, what I wanted regular. to ask you is like, I have this. Um, in my heart, I have this responsibility to stay strong. Yeah. Like, I, like, this is what put our family on the map. Sure. Lifting weights, like, literally made, you know, like, made Mark and I have a career in this kind of stuff. And so Absolutely. It's, it's like I have a feeling, like, I feel like I have a responsibility to stay strong. Sure. Not to be the strongest guy in the world. Yeah. But just to be able to still... You know, go on a trap bar and at least pull yeah. six hundred, right? Well, that's what makes you guys Which special. Is, is you're same, you're the same boat I am. I'm not gonna tell anybody that's listening, or anybody on my YouTube channel, or any of that other stuff, anything that I'm not willing to do myself 100 miles an hour, 100 percent. And I live the life in which I want other people to gain some motivation or um, some some traction in their abilities to get better and healthier. And I do believe that that's heavily correlated with how strong you are. And so, although I can't be as strong as I was in my prime, I feel that losing nearly 70 pounds of body weight and still being within 100 pounds of my all-time world record at 45 pretty years old is pretty good. fucking good, right? Yeah. So, it's one of those things where, to me, it's, it's uh, all that comes from the passion of wanting to be in the gym and train hard. It has nothing to do with the number. And I keep trying to tell people that, like, when you start putting yourself on a... Um, on a timeline of I want to be this strong with this number, you're automatically setting yourself up for a limiting amount of time that you're going to be able to sustain it. And so for me, it's about being able to sustain the passion in the gym. When I go into competition mode, say I was going to, you, you know, Chris Bell goes, calls me up, you know, you call me up and you go, hey, I'm going to give you a million dollars to do another power with mm -hmm. me. Well, good. I'll, I'll back off all my business yeah. and I'll focus on training. But that's all my body knows to do. When you start saying compete, that means everybody listening right now, all of my business and all the people that rely on me to keep them making money and surviving goes out the window. And I focus on that one goal. And as you get older and you start having more people involved in your business, it's not a smart thing to do. Yeah. And I don't mean to do that. It's just how I became a champion. And it is actually weird because if you continue to kind of do a little bit of everything, you might be better off. But that's not how we that's not right. how you operate. You go. Yeah, I for, just got to focus for, for me. Um, I wasn't the most genetically gifted as far as a world class lifter. So 100 percent of my focus had to go to that area in order for me to be really good. Now, there's an advantage to that, too. It, it taught me who I was. But it also created an immense amount of work ethic. And I also realized that anything I wanted to do in life was going to take decades, not fucking months. Yeah. You know, when I wanted to build a business, it took 15 years. When I wanted to break my first world record, it took 17 years. I don't give a fuck about how long it is because I'm here anyway. Yeah. So might as well do something badass, right? And if it takes me 10 more years to get where I'm at, fine. Yeah. I'm here anyway. And I think that's the problem with people is they set timelines and then the timelines don't fruition the way they thought they would. And then they give up when the reality is, you know, Everything's going to be difficult, yeah. and it's going to be a different path than what you think. So I, I don't and, know. I, and you, you were you've been in um like a tough position. Like I think that you're probably, as far as I know, up there is like one of the top powerlifting coaches in the world. The top people, you yeah. know, teaching us. Which you is learn. funny because I don't train a lot of powerlifters. Um, I train a lot of uh, tactical firemen. Um, you but know, you trained working with a lot of pro in a, in NBA NFL guys. Yeah, you trained at Westside Barbell. When sure. I met you, we were filming bigger, stronger, yeah. faster. You trained under like I wish a hero. I, was, I wish I, you know taking it back to that point. I wish I would have hit my prime just a little sooner because 
at that time, kind of Chuck and Louie were the main Chuck stay was of like that. the main, yeah. And uh, I, I didn't hit my... I tried to interview Chuck, and I got like one word out of him. Yeah, he's impossible. You know? he was am- <laughs> he, but he's like, it was so funny, because I, I was even scared to talk to him. That's how intense oh, the guy yeah, is. Oh, yeah, I was a training partner for seven years. Louie was pretty easy to talk to. Yeah. Um, but, man, talking to Chuck, it's like, oh, this guy doesn't want to talk to me. Chuck, Chuck, um, if you want to break it down to and I'm not speaking for him, but, you know, I was around him a long time. Yeah. Chuck is um, slightly insecure with talking on – he wants to demonstrate what he knows. He doesn't want to talk about yeah. it, yeah. which I thought was really awesome. I, and I'm going to tell you this because I've told it probably ten times, not necessarily on any podcasts. Training with Chuck, I got probably in seven years, I got four – that a boys four good jobs it was always good squat uh, you know a hey, great squat that was maybe four times in seven years the other time was hey you didn't push your knees out hard enough hey you didn't keep your chest up high enough everything he didn't care about my feelings he wanted that number to go up and that's what i needed at that time because i didn't need somebody to pat me on the back i needed a realist around me yeah to make my form i was perfect. gonna say like i think that's one of the major problems with like lifting and people maxing out every week mm-hmm. and doing you know we have a gym here that's free to the public and we have people come in and max out i see it they do it week after mm-hmm. week after week after week just coming in and trying to do the most mm-hmm. that they can do i've been guilty of that at some points mm-hmm. how do we keep that ego in check and how do we realize like that is not the way to do things well i think the first thing is if we look at super training as a whole and i'm just looking at it from the outside in but what i notice is that you know you got smoky and a couple of the other guys you notice that they post their maxes those guys don't really do it every week no no, no. But but what i'm saying is do. if you get away from them i know they don't either yeah. but that's what they're showing yeah. So I think the problem is when the general public walks in, that's what they think is expected. You, you notice when heavy. you watch me, what are most of my videos posted about? My winning warm-up, accessory movements. Well, I think everybody expects Mark Bell to come to their yeah. gym and, yeah. like, train with them. And Mark's like, no, I already trained yesterday. Today I'm just going to do some hamstrings. Mm-hmm. People are like, what? I thought you were going to, like, I thought you were, like, a workout guy. You know, like, and Mark's like, yeah, but I just, I. Like, I already did. Like, he doesn't let his ego. Yeah. Uh, I, whereas I know other people, like, I know that if you go and you challenge O'Hearn, he's going to take up the challenge. He'll take I, up the I, challenge, and he will probably beat the shit out of anybody. He'll kill you. He'll destroy you. I'll give you, I'll give you a short story on O'Hearn. So, you know, I'm at in 2018, I had just finished my last powerlifting meet. So with me and Stan and Mike O'Hearn are in my gym doing my workout that I fucking designed. So, you know, Stan's had rotator cuff issues since bodybuilding, so... Um, we're doing 185 pounds on the bar with 100 pounds of band and 120 pounds of chain. You know, that's a that's a hell of a speed day. Yeah. Right. It's 400 pounds. And so I'm bow, 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 bow. So we're just working in a circle. Stan's taking it a little easy because his shoulder's bothering him. Mike's not lowering it as fast as I am because he's not a power lifter, but he's blasting it up pretty good. So on the seventh set, we do six sets of speed work. We get to the seventh set and it's a burnout set. So Stan goes first. I think he wants, I want to say he gets like 14. Yeah. I get 27. So 27 with 400 pounds. Wow. Fucking O'Hearn does 30, and he's never trained with bands and chains that I've ever yeah, seen. Yeah, he's ridiculous. And I'm like, what the fuck? He just kicked the fuck out of me. And he's 10 years older you than I am. I hear the greatest Mike O'Hearn coup that he ever Dude. pulled off. The, he, he had Mark and I and Brian Shaw mm-hmm. in Vegas. He's like, I'll meet you guys at the gym. Eight o'clock. We're gonna do a crazy workout. We'll film it for the for the gram. You know, blah blah blah. Yeah. Great. We show up. It's eight o'clock. Eight thirty rolls around. Mike's not there. Mark's texting them. You're coming in. Blah blah. Eight forty five. Me and Mark and Brian like fuck it. Let's just start lifting. Yeah. So we just start lifting. Well, we start lifting and we're we're like halfway through the workout. Yeah. And at like nine o'clock, O'Hearn, like an hour late. O'Hearn huh. rolls in and he's like, "Yeah, you guys ready to train?" And so he's fresh. He's like, "Let's do some incline press." So he. He proceeds to beat Brian Shaw on the incline press, mm-hmm. doing like 405 for reps. And Brian mm-hmm. was training for World's Strongest Man and didn't want to get hurt. And I have never seen somebody so frustrated as Brian, like, because he was beating him on camera. And it was like. Not only beat him on camera, he underweighs him by 200 pounds. <laughs> and Michael Hearn, at that, what year was, depending on what year this is, he's over 50 years old. Yeah, it's a couple years ago. I mean, probably people, right, it was actually right around when he turned 50. Yeah, so this would have been 2018. Yeah. So what's funny is is that people don't realize, like, you can say whatever you want about Michael Hearn, natty, not natty. When have you ever seen him hurt? 
And whenever you ever seen well, him what fat. was great is that I know he came in. He came in like an hour after, so we were all worn down. He yeah. came in he, fresh, strategic. destroyed everybody, mm-hmm. and then everybody's like, "Ah, oh, come on, man!" I know. He's he's a genetic freak, man. He's sure. also a troller though, too. Like he'll oh. get you. He'll he likes he likes to fuck around. Big oh yeah, because like then he'll <laughs> beat you, and he'll be, "Ah, oh, beat you on bench." You you're, know? you're saying the fix was in. Yeah, the fix I was did. in. However, though, I do hold this over Michael Hearn. It's in a DVD extra. I just posted on Instagram. A couple weeks ago, yeah, um, I went in the gym and I benched 470, and Mike missed it. Nice, and uh, he still to this day will not ever acknowledge it. Ever acknowledge? I it. got a good one for you. I did it right in front of Arnold Schwarzenegger. Really? So we were training at Venice Beach. And you know how he gets up super early in the morning. He tells me to be there at 4 a.m. Does the same shit he did to you. He gets there at five. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Luckily. Cool. On East Coast time, it wasn't that early for me, so I'm just hanging out. Long story short, you know how he likes to do those super slow tempo box squats yeah. with the safety bar? So we do it. He does 500 with a 10-second negative, sits on the box for probably two, three seconds, and then stands up smooth. And so Arnold walks in, and I, and I tell him I do it with him. I said, throw another fucking plate on there. So now it's 600 because the bar yeah. is 10 or 15 heavier. I do 10 seconds down with a 10-second pause on the box and then come up with a speed rep Jeez. with another plate on top of what O'Hearn did, he wouldn't touch it. <laughs> but I, I, keep in mind, I was 300 pounds at the time, and I was berserker strong. But What's amazing is uh, Mike's like this super good-looking uh, fitness model. Yeah. But for some reason, when he squats heavy, his face turns into like a demon. Like It's oh. like I've never seen anything like it. The whole face gets red. The eyes bug yeah. out. It's like his, it's focus, like his focus points are – he's got the powerlifting focus point. I honestly think that if he wanted to have powerlifted – he could have been at his era uh, I think very the, good. I think the issue, I wouldn't say the problem with Mike. I'd say the issue with Mike is he's never went into one thing full blast. No. It's kind of what makes him great. Great bodybuilder, great power. Yeah, he's, yeah. he's good at all he's of it. He's a hybrid. Yeah, but if he just went specifically into bodybuilding, he might have done the same thing. If he just went into powerlifting, mm-hmm. he might have done the same thing. Although Lou Ferrigno would always talk shit about his bodybuilding genetics. And I still yeah. don't know why. Because well, I, I think O'Hearn looks fantastic. <laughs> well, so because, because Lou, Fer- from what I've heard from O'Hearn, O'Hearn, Lou Ferrigno and Mike O'Hearn used to train together, and that's why originally O'Hearn moved down to Venice yeah, Beach. Yeah, there's a little heat there for some reason. And uh, once O'Hearn won his first Mr. Universe title, um, Lou Ferrigno started wanting to charge him to ah. train with him. And Mike was like, what do you mean? I'm your training partner. I've heard the same story with Tom Platts with John Meadows. Hmm. So I guess John Meadows reached out to Tom Platts back when he was alive, and that was his idol because he trained yeah. so hard. Yeah. And he said, I went out there and I trained with him and everything's cool. And I'm not talking shit on Platts. I don't know if this is even true. But he said, the next week I got back home and I got a letter in the mail and it was a bill for $10,000. Oh, geez. So um, so uh, Tom Platts tried to charge. And yeah. you got to remember at this time. Tom um, Platts still looks great. Yeah, for 60 something years old. Mark, you got to get him on your podcast. He looks amazing. Yeah. And um, so does Lee Labrada still looks yep. great. And Lee Haney. Yeah, Lee Haney Lee, looks. What about Robbie Robinson? You train around oh, him? Yeah, yeah. 77 the years old. The problem with Robbie Robinson is he's not nice to people. That's I've heard the problem. That. Yeah. I don't I, know, but I've heard that. He, you know, he does like, walk like, I've, around I've in trained, his own world. I've trained at Golds for 25 years. Yeah. Guys never said hi to me. I train, I'm like really good friends with O'Hearn. I come right up to O'Hearn and say hi to him. He doesn't acknowledge me. Yeah. You know what I mean? I mean, so I'm like, yeah. he, he don't like me for some, whatever well, he reason. Probably, he, I think he's just socially awkward. Yeah. Because I think Michael Hearn, I asked him about it, too. I said, why and does Robbie just walk around and not talk to anybody? He goes, that, he's just in his own little world. I, I think so, too. Um, but, man, he is phenomenal. He might like, be so carb depleted he doesn't have any energy to say hi. I, I've never <laughs> seen anybody that looks like that Dude, in, he's in shredded his in 70s. His late 70s. Yeah. I think he's and almost like, 80. Uh, Charles Glass, he's kind of skinny nowadays because I don't think he's, like, on anything. Yeah. Or if he's on anything, he's on, like, a little bit of test. Yeah. But he still is shredded underneath. He thought, like he wears big yeah. baggy sweatshirts and everything. He's still shredded under there. Yeah, He's, yeah. You, you got a couple of those guys, man, that just you know are freaks, and they they still put the work and the time and the effort into it. And I give them all the respect in the world. Yeah, you know, because I know how hard that is even to keep in your forties, let alone sixties or seventies. Right? It's really weird when you meet somebody. So there's a lot of people that are in the fitness business. Um, I don't really want to name names because it makes people sound bad, but guys mm-hmm. that are in like their 60s that are like, they're like maybe a writer for a bodybuilding magazine or yeah. they're one of the old photographers and they're all like fat and out of shape and you're like, like you realize, oh, that guy used to be shredded. Yeah. And then like what happened and like my goal is to try to get better as I get older yeah. and not go that route to yeah. be like, you know, when I'm 70, I want people to go, hey, that's the guy that made bigger, stronger, faster. And he's still yeah. in really good shape. He's in better shape than he was at 50. Well, and that's some of the problems I have with a lot of these fitness gurus. 
um, they never did fucking jack shit. Yeah. And then they're telling everybody how to train. I'll throw one right under the bus right now. Mark Ripto. Yeah. You show me in a record book where he's done jack shit and he's telling other people how to squat and he looks like he's just a professional hot dog eater. I have never gotten any uh, good advice from that guy. I don't I think. I don't think anybody has. Yeah. The problem is is that some people are too stupid to realize I like, like... I never this, liked uh, his methods. Dude, I, I just wish... I wish I could get more people to listen to the smart. So I'm like, guys, been there, done that. Yeah. Master's degree. Like, don't listen to this well, technique. Even, even like with Louis, you had to take what Louis wrote. Mark had to take what Louis wrote. Chuck had to take what Louis wrote and modify it to yourself. Even though Louis would say that you don't and you're stupid for doing that, mm -hmm. we all have to modify stuff to yeah. modify don't miss. Yeah, and I think the other issue with a lot of that too is Louis, as much as he taught all of us, and I will always be forever grateful, I think – one of the biggest moments in my life, which I wish I could have reconnected with him before he passed uh, a year ago, was, you know, he wrote that samurai, the, the yeah. weight training samurai book, yep. and he sent it to me. I don't even know how the fuck he knew my address, but he sent it to me and he wrote in it. I, I posted it. He wrote in it, I'm proud of you, you know, and that was. Whew. So I tried to message him maybe a week later and I, I got voicemail, which isn't uncommon for yeah. him. And. uh that's a really uh, about, tough, tough relationship for you, huh? Yeah, bad. And then about a month ago, or about a month later, uh, the the squad that ran on him, I train. Yeah. And they they message me and they go, "Hey, man, we just picked up Louie. He died." And I go, "What oh, the fuck man. happened?" He goes, "Well, I guess from reading the reports, he uh, had checked himself into the hospital and his kidneys were zero percent. Oh, he had felt like shit for weeks, and they told him zero percent. They were going to have to put him on dialysis and." He didn't want to do it. He said, fuck that, went home and died six hours later. Yeah. But I never got to rekindle that. Yeah. And a lot of it was was me being stubborn. Um, I posted a picture. It must have been 2008 because I fell apart with him in 2007. Yeah. But you, you, like, you really loved that guy, huh? Oh, yeah. He was like my dad. Yeah. And I was around him since I was... Uh, He's kind of an amazing individual. Like, Mark was nobody. Like, literally nobody. Oh, I remember. And he moved out there, and Louie's like, come to breakfast with me. We were there at the same time. And Mark would go to breakfast every day with him, and he goes, I don't know why nobody else shows up. Mm -hmm. And he's like, I don't get it. Like, people have the opportunity to eat breakfast with Louis yep. Simmons every day. This is so cool. Mm -hmm. And then after Mark did it for a couple months, he goes, now I know why people don't show up. Yeah, he he's had a crazy. lot of resentment, he's anger, and he was also, if you want to look back at it now, he was he was – bipolar yeah he was one of those guys i wish i had the relationship you had with him if you were a guest and you were around him a couple times oh, a he year, was amazing to me he yeah. was amazing yeah if you're around him every day he was a fucking it, it's hard terror. for me to even see him as like uh a maniac or anything yeah, I, I know because nobody ever saw it and and like also we did a lot for him like i put him in bigger stronger faster mm -hmm. i think that did a lot for west side oh, you huge. know and i think that um i think if the west side versus the world would have came out two to three years later when we were all in our prime was, oh it would have been crazy it would have been insane that's what i was saying the west side versus the world i was like i was actually a little nervous about that movie coming out but man those you, guys huh, well me. They, they did a great they job they came and interviewed me and i'm thinking oh they're gonna make me look like a fucking asshole yeah because of all this Louis sent them. That was the first thing I realized that Louis was trying to apologize. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to think how to say this. He sent me this. He wanted me to be completely honest with what happened. And so I shot it, and I was still mad. Mm -hmm. And I told him more shit than I probably should have that they edited. But they made me look like fucking awesome because I was the first guy that you saw that left the gym and did better. And... Uh, Power Magazine or Powerlifting USA, you notice that there's that one picture at the Pro-Am that I'm holding all Louis. It's me and Louis, and I'm holding all the cash. Yeah. I'm still a bloated mess. Yeah. And what I said to Louis at that time was, like, I told you when I left I was going to come back and beat every one of you motherfuckers. And uh, he laughed it off, but that made him so mad. But I was pissed because this was only eight, nine months later after he threw me out of the gym, and he thought I was just going to quit and retire. My total went up 200 pounds. Yeah. And what we got in a fight about was recovery. I started reading all of these um, Russian books that he had the same library, but I ended up having my own. And what I started reading from Verkashansky, Medvedev, especially Medvedev, was that every fourth week they would go moderate, hard, berserker, fourth week, deload, yeah. recover, and put it back. And they said that that elongated your career, and not only that, made you stronger in a um, periodized situation. So I'm showing this to Louie. I'm not just saying it. I'm fucking showing him the books that he had originally, well, the Russians say this. To, well, the Russians say this too, motherfucker. And we, we started do. I started doing it. I said, well, I don't care what you say. I'm doing it. So I did it. 
and six months later, my total goes from twenty four sixty five to twenty six sixty five, which the ex- with the exact same system. Yeah, is and that I, the protocol of going like fifty percent, fifty five, sixty, like that kind of? So no, no, that was a three week way for speed. So what I did was I would introduce an exercise. Oh, you were doing this for the dynamic max for the max effort day. Yeah, I would introduce the exercise and become familiar. So the you're kind of doing the same thing you're doing with the speed work. You're, you're yeah, waving it, it. Yeah, I would wave it. So yeah. I'd go 80, 85. Yeah. The next week, 90, 92, which was optimal. The next week, I'd take it to the fucking moon, but only as much as my central nervous system would allow. And then the next week, I would deload and switch the exercise to a, a, like a, a safeguard movement. Is the West Side conjugate method the best way to train for strength? If you're very smart and you're very honest with your weaknesses, but if you think that it's just a copy and paste type deal, you're absolutely wrong because I'm going to tell you this right now. I was there for many years. The morning crew had a certain way of doing things. That was Chuck's way. and But Chuck's way was heavily developed over many, many years of understanding sure. which accessories to pick, where your weaknesses were, and what main lifts usually transferred the highest. The afternoon crew did something completely different yeah. because they were a different level of athlete. We were the best in the morning. So the stuff that we were doing was very fine-tuned to our individual group weaknesses as much as possible. The afternoon crew was kind of the do whatever the fuck you want. Let's see. Let's experiment. There was no experimenting in the morning crew. There was we know what the fuck works. Yeah. You bring the heat. Now, what's funny was when I left Westside, Chuck and I left at roughly the same time. When I went to train with Chuck alone, I was the first person that Chuck ever trained with. He goes, look, you got a certain system of what you're doing, and it's working, and you're getting stronger faster than anybody I've ever seen. You pick the accessories. I'll pick the main lift. So I'm fucking reading everything I can because I'm not bringing half ass shit to Chuck. Yeah. You know, Chuck just wouldn't have it. So it had to be hard enough for Chuck to respect it, but smart enough that it was going to work. And that's when we came to that those two proams in 08 and 09 and fucking decimated Westside Barbell. Yeah. You remember those years. Yep. And the real thing was, it was... And it was, like, sad. Like, I didn't want you guys... Like, I know. even though I love you, like, I don't want you to be... Like, don't be Westside. Come on, man. Yeah. <laughs> like, it's but Westside. But for me, for me it, was, it was a prove my point thing that, yeah. you know, at that time it was... I've read these books with a master's degree, and I fucking know more than you do. It was and kind I'm of not sad to watch West Side go downhill a little bit, like not yeah. be the— Yeah, and I, we all wanted—and that problem is, is Chuck and I and everybody else that left Well, everybody were, transferred out of gear yeah. and started lifting raw, yeah. and then Louie's like, well, we don't do that. And you're like, well, that's kind of dumb to not yeah. do that. You well, know? I, think, I think if Louie would have done that, I think it would have proved his point that his system was, was more bulletproof. But the problem is there's always that asterisk. It was the same thing with me. I squatted 1197 in gear, and then I come out of gear. Well, what's Matt got now? The world record was Scott Weech at 826. I smoked that fucker in one year. Yeah. And then raised it up 50 pounds. So the all-time world record went up 50 fucking pounds for me. And it's so hard to raw. Like, explain that raw versus like equipped. It's a completely different. It's like yeah. winning NASCAR versus Formula One, dude. Absolutely. It's completely different. But if you're training smart, like I was trying to explain to Louie before, we f- it doesn't fucking matter. Right, and that's that's one thing I think that hurt Louis is I think the system, with Louis at the helm in his prime, which would have been the years that Mark and I were there, yeah, would would have been the optimal system for anybody trying to get strong. By the time I feel that we left, Louis had gotten to an age, and also remember he was on a lot of Tylenol PMs yeah. just to sleep from the tracheotomy he had. That it, his his mind started to slowly. If you look at that gym though. Yeah, and you look at yourself. I know you're doing pretty damn well for yourself. You're working with like uh, some professional sports teams, like the Cavaliers and different things like mm-hmm. that. You have your own equipment company. Yeah. You're making your own. Um, by the way, if anybody's listening to this, you have your own um, books sure. and and PDFs and things yeah. that people can buy. And getting ready to drop in a conjugate book from Human Kinetics, which, as you well know, is not an easy When's publisher. That come out? It's supposed to come out in the early part of 2024. 400 pages, 1,000 references I've been working yeah, on for two years. that's what people need. It's insane. Turn that the shit that I too. turned back into and saw, it literally took my breath away, a couple of the pieces. I'll give one away. So I started figuring out that winning warm-up at 4 RPE, right? And then I started figuring out your main lift, whether it's speed or max, needs to be above 9, right? 90% yeah. of as fast as you can move it or 90% of strain. Then the accessory exercises need to be an 8.5 because if you're doing something for a heavy 10 – and the last reps of failure, it can't be a 10. Yeah. It's an eight and a half, right? Add all those up and divide it by three and find out what the percentage is. And you'll find that it's 0.72 to 0.74. 
10 different researchers from the Soviet Union figured out that that's where the minimal effective dosage was for a workout. To get what stronger. What the fuck? I had figured that out all on my own. To get stronger. Yeah, to get stronger and not over or underdo it. Your, over all of your reps and sets, the intensities need to be around 73, 74%. What kind of reps to get out of 73, 74%? Well, so Three if you six have your, reps? Um, well, it, well, no. So what I'm saying is, is like your your total accumulative percentage. Okay. So okay. if I do 40% I is my warm-up and then 90%, I'm just breaking the percentages. Yeah. 90% is my main lift and then 85% as hard as I can go is my accessories. You put all those together and divide That's, it by three, it's 72, 74%. Huh. And I'm like, motherfucker, they figured that out in the early 70s in Russia. Well, Russia figured out everything oh, they decades did. ago. So, and again, it's it's really interesting to see when you get to the top level. You've read those Russian books. They're almost like reading Braille. They're very yeah. hard to understand or like hieroglyphs. The Russians have so many crazy things that we don't even know about. The Russians did that on purpose because they wanted people to earn the education. Yeah. What I find now is when I open up the books and I've studied this so much— I'm like, oh, I understand what that means now because yeah. I fucking did it. You know, people clown the liver king for saying, hey, if you eat liver, it might help your liver. People go, dude, pff, that's no science, blah, blah. The Russians have had bioregulators that mm -hmm. are things that are made from an animal liver that you would inject in yourself and will help your liver. Mm -hmm. So it's not so far-fetched like a lot of these. Yeah. Now, maybe eating may not do it, yeah. but the way that they've uh, Russians have been able to like take it, concentrate yeah. it, inject it back yeah. in. It seems to be really effective. The thought process is sound. I yeah. mean, you know, if you're missing key ingredients, and that's why it's so important for anybody listening, look, find a good doctor, get good blood work, make sure you're not deficient in certain areas because you can go train all you want, but if you got no gas in the gas tank, well, i.e. It's interesting. You, you could buy Russian bioregulators right on Amazon right now today, and they're supposedly amazing. I don't know. I've never tried them. Yeah. But I'm, I'm actually like, I've been looking into it because I'm like, this is really weird. This is legal now. And by the time I probably try them and figure them out, they'll probably be illegal because yeah. that's how everything goes, right? Yeah, who knows? And then they'll be like, oh, shit, we missed out on this. You know? It's something to talk about with the Russians that I think people need to really understand is you can take a lot of the studies that have been done in America, whether it's been nutrition or strength training, and you could take them slightly with a grain of salt. I'm going to tell you why. One their amount of athletes or people that they studied were very marginal. Yep. Two, you had no control over them other than a very small time in that day. The Russians had control of them in barracks 24 hours a day like a fucking lab rat. Yeah. Right? And they were taking all of that stuff, and they were experimenting on it with top-level athletes where all that stuff had already been accounted for. So we'll never see that again because we don't have a communistic system. I'm not saying it's right. Yeah. But those books need to be held at a very high standard because the athlete was treated completely different. I'll give you a prime example. Mike Stone, one of the best researched or researchers in America. He's been writing papers since the 80s. He was in charge of um, who's the big uh, the big uh, black wrestler for the WWE they called Sexual Chocolate. Oh, yeah, Mark, Mark Henry. Henry. He was in charge of Mark Henry's training when he was in the Olympic Center. Mark Henry never showed up for training. And he couldn't do anything about it. Yeah. You think that would have happened in the Russian system? No. That's the problem. So, again, when you say, oh, well, this works or that works or this diet's good or that diet's good, be careful yeah. because who did they study that on? And so, although I like reading research papers and people go, hey, what did you see about this study and that study? You start looking well, at the methods and the people that they you used. You take a diet study and they go, you know, we took uh, 100 people. They were untrained. But uh, how, does that, how does that relate to you and I? It doesn't. But They're see, untrained. The is, they don't do anything. We all know A.S. Pilipin's chart, correct? Yeah. You've studied that. And for those that don't know, go look it up. That was done with 2,500 athletes that were a pretty decently high level. 2,500? And it all worked for every one of them? I want to see those percentages. Yeah, <laughs> I want to see those studies, and that's why Louis used it with so much success. Yeah. Interesting. Well, we got to go train. Let's go train. What do you want to do? Bench? Yeah, chest? we'll bench. We'll bench. I don't know. If holding up a 1,000-pound Harley for We're going to train with 2, Kenny, who's, miles. Uh, 21. Kenny Powers? Yeah. <laughs> 21 and jacked. Yeah, I saw him. And so we're, we're in trouble. You know what's funny is he saw all of my winning warm-ups. been using them for two years. Probably one of the jack, most he's jacked dudes I've ever seen at 21. One of the smartest, like... Uh, just uh, he's he's mini mark yeah so keep in keep in mind when you go watch the youtube videos on super training you're going to see how we're going to utilize winning warmups for bodybuilding and we're going to shoot that today we're going to shoot that today folks you guys ready for it let's do it all right buddy let's go man great see to man. see you yeah love you Boom. smash that was a good one